Hi, this is Paul. When I was in Chicago, I was talking about the fact that I don't know if I'd make a lot of videos and I didn't really have a lot of time. And Jacob and someone else, I don't remember who the other person was, said, well, why don't you play reruns? And I thought, well, that's kind of dumb because the videos are there already on YouTube. What, what, what that people can go back. But he said, well, people aren't going to find them because your channel was a lot smaller when you made a lot of those videos and people just pick up where they left off. I was also talking to a documentary filmmaker and he's just kind of toying with the idea of what it would mean to begin collecting some material just in case at some point he wanted to make a documentary on this little corner of the internet. And, and he made the point that if someone were to start in my channel, it's kind of like starting in a flowing stream because the conversation just goes on and on and on and on and it's hard to begin. I've thought about this problem before. So when when Jacob said, oh, you should do reruns, I thought, nah, I don't want to do reruns. But now that I don't really have a lot of time to do many videos right now, and that will probably be true during the summer, I thought maybe I should make some reruns. And I can make, I can play some reruns of some videos that I felt were meaningful. And if you listen to this and there are particular videos in the back catalog that you feel are meaningful or were meaningful to you, and perhaps they're one or two or three years old and so a bunch of the audience hadn't seen them you know leave a comment here in the comment section and maybe i'll pick one of those videos and post it here too so this video immediately came to mind because it was one of my personal favorites i remember making this video and being quite touched by it i'll warn you i do drop an f-bomb in the video it's the only video i've dropped an f-bomb in uh, because it was something I felt strongly about. But I was I was making some commentaries on Jordan Peterson's first book, 12 Rules for Life. And I talked about my father and I talked about the gospel. And uh, when I think about my videos, when I think about there are certain videos back there that I sort of cherish, this is one of them. So what I think I'll do is I'll just append that video to this one. And um, yeah, so... Let me know what you think of this, if you think this is a good idea. Let me know, again, if there are some videos that you remember or videos that you re-watch frequently that are at least a year or two or more in the past and you think others maybe should view them. And I'll consider them, I'll consider doing a rerun on it. So thanks for watching and let me know what you think. Hi, this is Paul and I've started going through 12 Rules for Life. An Antidote for Chaos, and I've started on the audiobook, and what I often do with these books is I'll, I'll go through the audiobook, and as I go through the audiobook, I'll highlight places, because Kindle syncs it nicely, and then sometimes I'll go back and read things, and I was, you know, I did the little video yesterday, the little joke about the um, lobsters gossiping, and, but, but a number of things hit me right away in the lobster chapter in the book, which I, which I really enjoyed. Now, a lot of this stuff is the same stuff that that you've heard in Maps of Meaning, but as one of the points I've been making over and over again is, are these different um, ways of communicating, these different mediums and how they shape, um, how, th how they shape the message. And so it's, it's been really fun um, actually listening to Peterson. Peterson does the, does the voice in the audio book, the audible version of the book. And so it's been, it's been fun listening to it, listening to him as a reader instead of um, more extemporaneous speaker. Uh, that's, that's been kind of fun. But the, you know, the lobster chapter really, really caught my attention. And, and here he's writing about lobsters. And again, this is, this I think is part of the, the more linear, the more linear form a book takes rather than let's say, um, spoken word. In the aftermath of a losing battle, regardless of how aggressively a lobster has behaved, it becomes unwilling to fight further, even against another previously defeated op um, opponent. A vanquished competitor loses confidence, sometimes for days. Sometimes the defeat can, can have even more severe consequences. If a dominant lobster is badly defeated, its brain basically dissolves. Then it grows a new subordinate's brain, one more appropriate to its new lowly position. Its original brain, just as it's sophisticated, um, just isn't sophisticated. Its original brain just isn't sophisticated to manage the transformation from king to bottom dog without virtually complete disillusion and regrowth. Anyone who has experienced a pain 
A painful transformation after a serious defeat in romance or career may feel some sense of kinship with a once successful crustacean. And again, I thought the I thought the entire lobster chapter was was really good, and it was fun to hear Peterson kind of in this more in this more linear format as an author. And and what really struck me in that was was the story of Christ and of Jesus and his crucifixion because. We would imagine that Jesus, like the crustacean, would, would you know, dissolve and have a smaller brain, or, or his disciples, his disciples would be crushed because you know during Jesus' crucifixion, the disciples they hide in despair, and only the women and young John, who um, at that point might just have been a teenager and therefore would not have caught the attention of of those who who killed Jesus. Um, they, were, they were the only ones who dared to show at the at the crucifixion. And one of the themes that you get in the Bible is is that it's it's the women again and again who um, who stand by Jesus, and it's it's the women who show up at the tomb to do the dirty work, and it's the women who dare to go to the cross, and it's the women who supported Jesus in his ministry. Now, the crucifixion was an act of, of political drama to remind everyone that Rome was on top. And the, and the sign that Pilate posts over the objection of, of those who brought Jesus to Pilate to crucify him, king of the Jews in three languages, which, which was just complete irony. It was a clear message to the, to the Jewish people at the time that, that Rome is your king. And you know, in the Gospel of in the Gospel of John, quite famously, the crowd cries out, "We have no king but Caesar." And you know, this is a this has been a bone of contention in the Gospels for for years. But but what struck me about the the lobster piece and Peterson was how the Gospel story takes this paradigm and flips it on its head. And you know, one of the things I I am I am terrifically indebted to Jordan Peterson for so much that I've learned so far from him. And I think part of the reason that I, you know, I was so, you know, like so many of you, I was so immediately hooked on his videos is was I was, I was just learning so much. And, you know, one of the, some of the stuff from his, you know, as a practicing, you know, as a clinical psychologist, uh, you know, don't, don't create safe spaces, you, because there are no safe spaces. And, and in fact, um, safe spaces just make people weaker. You make you make people more courageous to face an unsafe world, and, and I thought that was exactly right. But but it has to be voluntary, and this gets into this gets into Jesus. You know, there's this funny thing in the gospel in terms of the you know in what way is Jesus volitionally involved in his own execution and and the gospels very clearly show that this is a deliberate thing he's heading towards but it's you know right on that line and then you know how Peterson always talks about chaos and and order and and so for Jesus the, the, the crucifixion is right on this line where on one hand he tells his disciples I'm going to I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be turned over into the hands of men and 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 then you know he's he's tried by Pilate and anybody you know the, all the gospel accounts are pretty clear that you know that Pilate understood that this was a political hit job and Pilate understood that this man didn't do anything worthy of of a capital crime and that you know there were other motivations involved in terms of bringing Jesus in for crucifixion but what what happens is is that Jesus doesn't plead his own case and obviously the the very famous story in the garden of gethsemane um not my will will but yours be done and and so and so you get the sense that you know it has to be voluntary and jesus jesus crucifixion he has to go to the cross willingly but but yet this is an atrocity and an outrage against justice and i mean all of those paradigms come together and you know one of the things that you know the reason I, I first started watching Jordan Peterson. You know, I'd heard about the pronoun, the pronoun thing, and I thought, "Huh, isn't this you know this this, this wonder like this burning bush?" And I thought, "Huh, isn't this funny? This 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 lecture in psychology in the University of Toronto won't use they instead of she and her." And I thought, "My goodness, that's that that's quite something." And then I saw this video of of him at the McMaster University, and I saw everyone just heaping insults on him, and and I saw him, you know. You know, keeping his act together and not getting simply vindictive against his enemies, but but trying to trying to make a rational case for, 
you know, for, for the points he was trying to make. And, and so, you know, this is, this is something that I've learned from Peterson with respect to hardship that, you know, he always talks about the, um, the predatory mechanism and the prey mechanism. And, and obviously with his future authoring program, he uses some of the prey mechanism, prey mechanism. You have to, you have to write out what you fear and, and you have to, in a sense, run from it. But, but you know this this idea that you really have to turn from prey to predator because once you get your will involved and once it becomes volitional it changes what it does now i'm going to be a little um a little autobiographical in this because this this made me think of my father and and next month is the 5th anniversary of my my father's death my father was a um was a was a minister like i am and um you know he, a lot of people recognize that that i look like him he yeah he, if you want to know his story he wrote a he basically wrote an autobiography for the family in which he he kept all of these stories of ministry from patterson new jersey where he ministered for a very long time and he you know, sometimes people will ask me, a number of people in the comment section have asked me, you know, what, what are, what are some books that you recommend? Well, probably the most, one of the most formative books in my life was the book of my father, not actually the literal book he wrote, but the, but the book that was his life. And because he was, you know, raised by my grandfather, and I'll talk about him in a few minutes, you know, on the, and the prairies during the depression. Um, and then, you know, probably the only the only black folks he ever saw were porters on the trains that they would take from these from these no place prairie places to Grand Rapids, where my grandparents were from. And and then after after seminary, he goes and works in Patterson, New Jersey, among and that little business down there. I'll put a link to the eulogy that I gave him in in the memorial service that that we held in Patterson. His funeral was in Whitensville, Massachusetts. And and then we had a memorial service in Patterson a few months later. But, you know, Patterson, New Jersey in the 1960s, Patterson, New Jersey has always been a place where, um, you know, it's people are going to hate me for saying this, but, you know, Patterson has always been a shithole. And, and when we visited Patterson, um, when we well, not all of Patterson is a shithole. But when we visited Patterson in, in 2013 with my family, my kids had never been to Patterson. And I remember my son, we're driving through Patterson and my son looks around and he's like, you grew up here? And and I, when I visited New York City in 2006, I was just amazed at how clean the city was. And, and I had grown up in the, you know, 60s and 70s outside of New York. And this was a beam and, um, you know, New York going bankrupt and all of this kind of stuff. And New York had this amazing transportation and the trans transformation in the 2000s and you know, is this glamorous, wonderful place that people love to go in Times Square? They turned from you know the the peep show palaces into you know kind of a kind of a Walt Disney. But but Patterson hasn't had any such transformation, and Patterson has been a place where where immigrants have come, wave after wave of immigrants. That's how you know the the you know the Dutch who who got there and the you know the Italians and the Irish and and then you know between the wars the great migration of african americans you know moves you know moves up into patterson and the and the dutch the dutch community the dutch crc community that was there you know a few of those people said you know we we you know it's it's our christian duty to 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 do what we can to help these people and they started a little you know a little gospel a little gospel sandwich mission which was the kind of thing you started in the 40s and 50s where it's like well I'll give you this bread but you got to sit and listen to this sermon and and they called my father to try and take this take this little mission and turn it into a church because they knew it was it was unsustainable and that's and that's exactly what my father did and so he came there and there were always a few you know this is Angie Vogel there were just uh, there were always a few brave souls who who had a heart for these these children in this community that were that were desperately poor and and living in the the workers housing in in Patterson and and so that's where my father came and 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 he didn't know anything about African Americans or the black community but he spent 36 years there living and serving and you know starting addicts rehabilitation programs and you know he he lived he lived his life and if you go if you go on my facebook if you're my face, facebook friend um and if you 
friend me on Facebook, I'll probably say yes if I look at your page and see that you're not a bot. But, you know, my father, there, there, there's tons of stories where my father just spent his life pouring himself out in Patterson. And um, if anybody needed to be moved, there were many times as a as a teenager when I was old enough to be helpful that I'd go with him with the with the church van and help move somebody or or move a stove or you know and and he would visit people in the in in the rottenest places in Patterson and he would he would sit and talk with you know with with drug users and and people whose lives were absolutely coming apart. And, you know, that's how he spent his life. And, and you know, you, as a kid, you just grow up in it. You just watch him. It's just normal for you when you see it. And so this was, you know, this was this was my childhood. And this was this was the life I lived. And this is an Easter Sunday, probably in the in the mid 70s. At some point, Easter was always a, a big, big day in Patterson. And all these folks who were raised in church from the south would would come to church on Easter in their best clothes. And there's David Apple. He works in uh 10th Presbyterian in Pennsylvania right now and and then this was this was how I grew up this was Northside and it was a you know as a kid you don't know any different but it was it was this looking back on it now it was this beautiful place where where all kinds of people came together and it was an alternative church for the black folks and it was an alternative church for the white folks and and people who would never be friends one of the one of the families here is the um was the president of Holland American Lines and you know there there were there were always a few people who had had wealth that kept the place going and um but it was just this beautiful place where 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 people could come together and serve each other and so my father spent his years you know pouring himself out for the the people of Patterson but but, but you know where did this come from well well his father that's Hiram the one in the tie he he seemed to wear a tie every day because his wife liked it his grandma's sitting right next to him and my dad is next to my grandma and and my aunt Glenda is over way on the I guess it'd be the right um or the left and my uncle Dave is way over on the right my uncle Dave became a cop and um on long island and and for years was a was a cop and then when he retired he went down to florida and he's a he's a bicycle gang preacher now and you know my my grandmother hated beards my poor grandma we all grew them but you know so this is where my father grew up and and my grandfather took this call to canada to owen sound ontario and he didn't want to go there and and that call call cost him tremendously and my aunt the the young girl who's sitting there had to go there when she was 13 years old and the school system was horrible and everybody picked on Americans and and it was a horrible thing and so I, I and and I told this story I told this story at her funeral which was just a you know not very long ago and I'll put the link to that in 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 the comments here too in YouTube but you know she you know, she cried every night because she was so angry at them. And my grandfather, you know, had to explain to her that, look, we did not want to come here. But what was happening at that point in Owen Sound, Ontario, Ontario, was that the Dutch and the Frisians were, after World War II, there wasn't a lot of food in Europe. You know, Eisenhower was really worried about how to keep Europe fed after the war because Europe was so destroyed in the Second World War. And so, these Dutch and these Frisians were coming to places like like Ontario, Canada, and 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 California, and and they had nothing. And they were now we look back on it, they were traumatized by the war. You know, they couldn't get along with each other. They could be petty. They could be vicious. And my father, my grandfather, felt the need to go to Canada, and so he left his son, my father, in Iowa, where his previous church was, and and that was one of his longest charges, where he, um, where he. He would, you know, meet people who pick up people from the train who were who were coming in, and these people, you know, were traumatized by the war and they had lost everything, and they were, you know, coming into a place like Canada, and often people would come in and they'd have, you know, it was kind of like indentured servitude, 1950s style, where they'd have a contract with someone, they'd work for someone, and not all the people, the farmers who would bring them over, would treat them fairly, but. You know, these Dutchmen came and my father was, my grandfather was the Dutch preacher and he had to pick people up and, and get them settled. And, and so he poured his life out for these, these refugees coming from the Netherlands. And so, you know, when I came of age, I, in many ways, just, just did what my father did. And my wife very much wanted to be a missionary because her, her parents were missionaries in Africa. And so it just, as it turned out, I became a missionary in the Dominican Republic and I worked with, I worked with Haitians. And, you know, I think back on it now and I was, 
you know, they were so gracious to me. I was just a young kid. What the heck did I know? And, and here I am trying to be helpful. And, you know, you, you're learning, you know, you're learning Spanish and you're, you're, you know, crucifying the language. And, but, but I learned way more from them than I'm sure they ever learned from me. And, you know, I raise my, you know, I start having kids. And so this is, you know, this is my oldest son when he was, when he was just a, a little fella. And, and this is, this is where we grew up and the people that, you know, he started his life amongst. And, and then I come to Sacramento, California and this, um, this just beautiful, um, crazy church takes me in and um you know and i've pastored here for for 20 years now and and the community keeps changing and the church keeps changing but in some ways it's not unlike my father's church and and the irony is that i never wanted to be a pastor because i i looked like my father i walked like my father i sounded like my father and and people would call me little rev and um and so i decided i never wanted to be a preacher but then i went to seminary and because you know I liked theology, and and then my wife wanted to do mission work, and then we we left the mission field and we came, and you know I wound up doing work that's a lot like my father, and and sometimes my mother will laugh because you know the the people I work with here in Sacramento, you know this is Daniel again someone who you know homeless man, incredible problems, mental illness. Um, substance abuse. He's in jail right now, and he's probably going to be in prison for a while. But for about five years, you know, I couldn't get him to not live against the door of my office. And I'd come to my office, and the, you know, he he would completely trash. He would turn the, <laughs> he would turn the walkway out to my office into a shithole. <laughs> and you know, he was a he was raised a Mormon, and he was a tortured soul because how are you a Mormon and an alcoholic? And and so, you know, this is this is the life he led. But again, in many ways I learned more from him than, than I'm sure I ever than I ever taught him or or did for him. And 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 so this this to me, you know, gets into when I was listening to, to Peterson and the serotonin, um, you know, before we get that tonight we have our, our little bucko meetup here in Sacramento and I'm I'm asking people to come and share their favorite clips and one of the clips I want to share is towards the end of the Tramps Liminal video when, when Peterson is talking about hell. Because I really connected with that because you know, most of my life I've lived in places that people with um people with better opportunities flee. My my father you know, raised us in Patterson. And my grandfather willingly went to Owen Sound to meet those refugees. And, you know, I live in an area of Sacramento that, you know, people from the nicer areas are sometimes like, you know, we don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm nervous about going down there. And I, I frankly think it's, it's a little silly. And, but this is, this is, in my opinion, this is what Christians do. The Christian story is a story of a God who, under no compulsion, sees the misery that his creation has brought upon himself, descends into it, and becomes subject to their misery. I mean, on one hand, it's it's the great hero story. And and as Peterson says, I think it's he's exactly right, it's the archetypal hero story. And Jesus is this archetypal hero. And that's true. And as C.S. Lewis, I'm just about ready to start the C.S. Lewis series. I know some of you are waiting for it. As C.S. Lewis says, the, um, you know, this is this is the this is the true myth. This isn't Osiris. That, you know, this isn't this isn't some some god that lived at some uncertain time. This is a man who comes and is born in four to six B.C. and is crucified somewhere around thirty A.D. And, and in my opinion, there's there's sufficient historical evidence to believe that that all of this really happened, and and so Peterson talks about hell, and these are the places that I've lived, and these are the people that I work with, and and as a pastor, just like as a therapist, you 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 regu you regularly visit people in their hells, and you hear their stories of pain, and and there's no one of the, one of my big complaints about life in America is that America wants to say things like, well, if you can dream it, you can have it. And most of the people I look at, it just simply isn't true. And and then when I lived overseas, one of the things that, 
you know, really crushed me emotionally in terms of working with the Haitians was, you know, I come in there as a kid and I think, you know, with all of our smarts and all of our money and I have a, you know, denomination backing me in a mission agency that, that we can really help these people. And you begin to learn just how complicated our brokenness is that, you know, all of the money and all of the power and all of the smarts and all the medical technology and all the psychology, you know, and I have that all the time here now too. Many of the people I work with are, um, you know, struggle with mental illness or struggle with things in their life. And here in this area of Sacramento, there's a lot of group homes and, and a lot of people just have no chance. And, and so when I, you know, when I read Peterson's um, portions about the serotonin levels and he's, he's, he goes into more detail, maybe I just don't remember it from his classes, but he goes into a lot of detail in the book. You know, this is also true of low ranking human beings and, and those, um, and those low le levels decrease more with each defeat. Low serotonin means decreased confidence. Low serotonin means more response to stress and costlier physical preparedness for emergency. As anything whatsoever may, um, as anything whatsoever may happen at any time at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy and rarely something good. Low serotonin means less happiness, more pain and anxiety, more illness and a shorter lifespan among humans just as among crustaceans. If you are a low status 10, by contrast, male or female, you have nowhere to live or nowhere good. Your food is terrible when you're not, um, your food is terrible when you're not going hungry. You're in poor physical and mental condition. You're of minimal romantic interest to anyone unless they are as desperate as you are. You are more likely to fall ill, age rapidly, and die young with few or any to mourn you. Even money itself may prove of little use. You won't know how to use it because it is difficult to use money properly, particularly if you are unfamiliar with it. Money will make you, will make you liable to dangerous temptations of drugs and alcohol, which have been more rewarding if you've been deprived of pleasure for a long period. Money will also make you a target for predators and psychopaths, and you thrive on exploiting those who exist on, who thrive on exploiting those who list on the lower rungs of society. The bottom of the dominance hierarchy is a terrible, dangerous place to be. And I read this, I immediately thought of my friend Daniel, because, you know, that you reading this, this is exactly his life. And again, I know Peterson, you know, did a lot of work with, um, with, with alcoholics. And, you know, this is, this, this is exactly his story. And he's, everything, what he says about money and about pleasure and all of that, all of that is just true. And, and, and for the work that my father did in, you know, the work I did in the Dominican Republic and, you know, you talk about these people not immigrating. These people are heroes to me because I'll tell you, these people have nothing and they overcome. And, and, you know, the same with, with many of the people that my father worked with in Patterson and the, you know, the, the, the trauma that I've seen in the black community and the, you know, the, the folks moving up from the South. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And these are the lobsters that have been defeated. And so I ask, how do you pour out your life? You know, I was reading, um, oh, you know, here's the thing. Why, why do poor people go to church? I mean, these, these, these Haitians, they're illegal in the Dominican Republic. You know, they, they live in banana leaf shacks. They can be jerked around by the government. They, they, they work for a pittance and they go there because life there is better than in Haiti. These people are screwed. You know, they, they have no passport that's going to let them into the U.S. And if they can come in somehow, they're going to try. Of course they're going to try. I would. You know, my ancestors did. And so poor people go to church. Why do poor people go to church? Well, you know, I really appreciated Harari's book, Sapiens. And, and one of the points that Harari makes is that, you know, if you listen to Richard Dawkins and this piece that I did a few videos ago about Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, they're talking and, and Dawkins makes the point that, you know, genetics evolve slowly. And then Harari talks about the, you know, I, I the, um, the cognitive revol revolution. And what that means is that we, we can't, our genetics don't evolve fast enough to, 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 to give us an, so let's talk in Darwinian terms, our, our genetics don't evolve fast enough to give us an advantage in the society. And so human beings in the cognitive revolution develop this whole new level, which is the story level. And, and how that plays out 
in my story for the places that, you know, for, for these people, I mean, I was always amazed by Daniel, how he, you know, he would come to my church because my church is about the only church that anyone, you know, would, would have him in. And he's in jail because he eventually attacked a man in my church and an old man and cut up his hand. Um, you know, Daniel was a dangerous man and, and Daniel threatened my life on, on a nearly daily basis, but you know, I'm younger and healthier and larger. And so he never, you know, decided to physically take me on when he was in one of those moods. But you know, this is, this is, this is life in the lobster world. And, and, you know, so, so why, why do people go to church and what is the gospel for? And, you know, it's, it's we're transcending this misery and these people are screwed. You know, I don't know a lot of the faces in this picture, but knowing the story, you know, many, many of the little girls in this story would, would, you know, would probably get pregnant before marriage and struggle to raise kids. And then many of them would have to raise their grandkids because daughters would get lost in the drug world. Many of these sons would be incarcerated or get lost in the drug world or, or die young. That was, that was the story in Patterson. My father did funeral after funeral after funeral. Often the, the funeral directors would call him because, you know, there's nobody to do these people's funerals. <laughs> And when I visited Daniel in jail a few months ago, you know, he, I was the only one who'd ever visited him. And, you know, and he says to me, you're my only friend and I'm a shitty friend, you know. I'm... Yeah, there are hells. But but what is the gospel and, and what do we do by by this by the story world? We transcend the serotonin deficits that 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 the that the I'm going to use vulgar language that that the fucked of the world it's their only chance and and there are millions and millions maybe billions throughout history i think about the people who were you know the people who were you know, buried in the Great Wall of China. These are workers nameless no one will ever remember their names and this is the human story and so you say well what should you do in a world like this well, on one hand, you think you should rise to the top and get everything you can and make your life great. And yeah, that's reasonable. I, I understand that. But, but what Christians say is, is something different. This is the Sermon on the Plain, which is Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal regions around Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. These are the little people of the world. They have no hope. They're going to die young. They're going to, you know, everything Peterson says about him is true. Those troubled by impure spirits. Now, an, an impure spirit would be, you know, it could be mental illness. It, you know, it, it could be spirits. It could, whatever it was, but basically impure there essentially means that the, these are... These are these are causes to keep people estranged from society. And so often people come and they knock on my door of my church and they knock and say, you know, oh, are you the pastor? Yeah, I'm the pastor and I, I need money. And, and what goes through my head immediately was you weren't hatched. Something in your life happened. And, you know, if, if I run into trouble, you know, if I have no place to stay, I can call my sister or my mother or my how many friends in Sacramento and say, I need a place to stay. And they'll say, Paul, come in, please. I'll take you in. But when by the time people get to my door in Florin Road, they have no one who will open the door for them. You know, that probably because they've they've been lost in a bottle or lost to drugs and they've they burned through all of their relationship and they're trying to survive and now they come to my door and they have no other no other option but to talk to a total stranger to try and get three or four bucks you know maybe for a beer because they woke up sober and this is this world These are the people coming to Jesus. And all the people tried to touch him. You know, one of the things, you know, Daniel would, would, would camp right in front of my door. And I'd have to step over him. And often, you know, if he was in a, depending on where he was in his mood cycle, you know, sometimes he'd just need a hug. 
<laughs> these two strange men in their 50s, one hugging the other. And and then when I visited him in prison, he's like, oh, I just want to come home. I said, Daniel, what, what do you mean home? You know home by your office. He says, I, 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 I you know, I, I sit there and I remember the, I said, the times that, that you stepped over me. I said, of course I stepped over you. You slept right in front of my freaking door. I couldn't get into my office without stepping over you. But that was the one form of meaningful human contact he would have because a lot of the other stuff, whether they were the what he'd call the crack whores or the drug dealers or, you know, it's a jungle out there and people just don't touch the civilians because they know the cops will come down on them. But it's a jungle between everyone at that level. So these are the people coming to Jesus. Looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are those who are poor. Are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. And, and you know, I mean, have a brain when you read this stuff. Jesus, you know, what, what are you, nuts? What do you mean, blessed are the poor? One of my favorite movies is Leap of Faith because Steve Martin is having this conversation with Jesus on the crucifix that he's been doctoring because he's a fraud preacher. And 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 Steve Martin says to the crucifix, you know, blessed are the meek. All the meek get in this world is the short end of the stick. Yeah, that's right. Jesus says, blessed are the poor. Why? Blessed are those who's you have been crushed like a lobster and and their their brain is is remade and their you know the serotonin you know keeps them down but woe to you who are rich for you have already received your comfort woe to you who are well fed now for you will go hungry woe to you who laugh now for you will mourn and weep woe to you when people speak well of you for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets 1 Corinthians, brothers and sisters, think not, um, think of what you were when you were called. And this is what happens in the gospel, that this story verse that changes, in a sense, our, our genetics sets us up into this trap of being, a, being, being on the bottom. And Jesus comes along and says, follow me, because I was at the top and I'm, I'm going to the bottom for you. And in fact, I'm going to get to the bottom and you're going to kill me and push me down even lower. And because of that, I didn't put Philippians 2 in that, but I did it in a sermon a couple weeks ago. Because of that, the Father lifted me and made me to the highest place. This is the gospel. And this is why the poor and the wretched and the people who have no hope in this world come into church and listen to Jesus because here is an archetypal hero who had everything and descends into chaos. And that chaos crushes him and he rises from the grave. And and I'm a, you know, I did this big thing about literal, well, I think when Jesus came out of the grave in history, his disciples saw his hand and they touched him and they felt the wounds, and, and I think it's amazing that the wounds remained because these, you know, sometimes women will be a little, you know, embarrassed about stretch marks, and I'll, you know, I, I don't often tell them this because they don't respond well, but, you know, I'll say, hey, those those stretch marks are badges of, those stretch marks are badges of courage. Those are your, those are your medals of honor because, you know, at the risk of your life, you gave birth to another human being. You know, it's built right there into creation. And C.S. Lewis is going to go into this in his book, Miracles. And so Paul says to the church at Corinth, which was a mess of a church, um, brothers and sisters, think not, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, and the church is full of unwise people. Not many were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. And again, in the ancient world, and you know, with the exception of you know the American experiment, birth was everything. It, it determined your destiny, and it still does in many ways. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 
God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify things that are so that no one can boast before him. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. So it is with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And you're like, well, what does that mean? And it means that what Christianity does is takes people who they've got no shot at anything in this world. And again, I, this is who my father ministered to. This is who my grandfather ministered to. This is who I minister to. And, and this, I think, is what Christians do. Because, you know, hey, it's the age of decay, baby. Everything you build is going to come apart. Every, you build a great business, someone will come along later and, you know, pick it clean. It's, you know, it's what the teacher in the book of Ecclesiastes sees. This is life in this world. And, and so Jesus comes to the, to, to the poor and the wretched and says, you know, you can be sons of God. Which in the ancient world meant you'd have the highest status. You, you're going to be, you're going to be top lobster. And, you know, I, th I thought in many ways, I, I thought of this when I was making this video, how I should, I should take a lobster. I have some lobster pictures because when I go back to New England, we always eat lobsters, but take a lobster and stretch out its claws because in some ways that's Jesus on the cross. That's what the story is. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with while I was with you except Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great trembling, with great fear and trembling. And, and Paul comes to Corinth after, a, you know, Paul had a miserable life. And, and people, you know, sometimes people are like, well, Jesus has a wonderful plan for your life. And I read the, in the Bible, I think, well, it didn't work out so well for Paul. You know, he was, you know, Saul who became, you know, Saul, Saul's his Hebrew name. Paul is his Greek name. You know, he, you know, after he gets, after he, you know, he was a successful Pharisee and had a great education, had a promising career as a as a Jewish, um, you know, as a as a Jewish Pharisee and a teacher of the law. And then he throws it all away because he has this vision on the road to Damascus. And and if you read the rest of his life, everywhere he goes, he he causes a riot and he's stoned and he's shipwrecked and thing after thing after thing. And you get to read a book like Second um, Timothy, and the guy seems depressed, and he says, "I've only got one friend left." And, and, and you would think he would turn around and say, well, gosh, meeting Jesus was the worst thing that ever happened to me. But he never says that. He always talks about it being the best thing that ever happened to him. So I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. And, you know, People might ask how you become a Christian, and I, you know, it's God does this. I'm, I'm, I'm a Calvinist. You know, God, God invades us with His Spirit, and He, He, He brings us to to places we don't want to go, and He, He puts us around people that no sane person would want to be around, and and we decide we want to pour out our lives for these people. Does Jesus make you courageous and vital? Yes. But his way offers you serotonin in the midst of misery. And that's just it. And, and you have to ask, well, well, what do the fucked of what option do the fucked of the world have? No, they, don't, they don't have a lot. And Jesus comes and says, you know, the greatest among you is the servant of all. Well, shoot, if you're already the servant of all, how can that change you? There's there's no physical way for so many people to to, to, to be saved. And, and here's the irony that for so many people who are, who are screwed, it's the, it's the, it's the self-screwed nature of it that really brings them down. And, and why is it that in, in many places of the world, when, when the poor, when the poor meet Jesus, you know, they start saving money, they start taking care of their kids better, they start speaking the truth because this is what their Lord wants them, I and not everyone, and not perfect, and Christians and pastors are liars, and, and, and that's all true, and the church is full of hypocrisy, and, and failed people, and all kinds of misery. I mean, you're not gonna, you won't get an argument from me on that. So, so, Jesus makes us courageous and vital. Jesus 
Jesus allows me to have serotonin when the defeated lobster says I can't. And it offers you a hero story, even if you are a hero that nobody knows about. Sermon on the Mount. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have, the, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And to me, this only makes sense with the resurrection. And I've used this little They've used this little gif for, you know, the incarnation, for the logos, where the word becomes flesh. Well, in resurrection, the 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 amazing story of Jesus where the the poor and the, the mistreated and the screwed of the world have hope becomes flesh in the resurrected body of Jesus, where he shows up in a locked room and he eats a fish and they touch his flesh. And all of the gospel accounts. You know, if you listen to N.T. Wright on the on the resurrection stories, you know, what, what's amazing about all of the gospel accounts is that of the resurrection is that none of them sit down to try and get the story straight. It's all over the freaking map. Why? Because it's exact. Nobody knew how to talk about this thing. How, is, is this Jesus? Is this not Jesus? What's going on? But but people begin to believe it. And, you know. Keyholes become exclamation points, become changes in the physical world. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, fields, children and fields, along with persecutions. And, and again, if... I'll tell you, I, I wouldn't listen to, I wouldn't be so interested in Peterson if he wasn't persecuted. Because the truth is, if you're going to do anything in this world that's meaningful, there's going to be opposition. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And so then, you know, I know there's a lot of atheists and skeptics and even watching this, and and what if I'm wrong? Hey, I could be wrong. You know, the the, the the resurrection stories, people look at that and say, gosh, how, how can you believe that? That, that, that? that he would come back to life. And and how could you believe what, what Paul says, that if we are um, in our baptism, we are crucified with him, and in his resurrection, we are raised with him. And Paul keeps saying again, we are we are in Christ. Well, well, what if I'm wrong? What if the resurrection didn't happen? What if my family is a bunch of idiots for spending their lives on people who are just plain screwed? What if this is all just a fantasy? And, and you know, my answer to that is, how else do you want to live your life? You know, it's short, you know, maybe it's you know, so many people are born, you know, so many people are born screwed. It's short. How, how are you going to spend it? Um. Yeah, you know, dealing with dealing with people like, you know, dealing with people like Daniel, uh, not fun. Not not fun at all. And and you know, yeah, chimps with snakes and, and I can go through as pastor, you know, I know the ups and downs, the turmoils, the the sins, the the struggles that 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 these that these folks have. This is what this is what pastors do. We you know we pour out our lives and, and you say, well, 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 why would you do this? And, and I look back and I say, yeah, you know, things are hard, but I, I'd, I'd rather spend it no other way. And one of the things that always struck me, um, you know, my pastor kind of died with his boots on. He had a, he had a, he had a heart attack when he was sitting across the table at a coffee shop meeting with a guy who, you know, just, just needed someone to listen and someone to talk to. This is what pastors do. And I remember in, in my father's later years, I would ask him, Dad, do you, you know, do you get tired of it? Because I know a lot of pastors, they get into their 50s and 60s and they're just done. You know, it's they're just worn out and they don't they don't want to do it anymore. They don't want to listen to people. They don't want to clean up, they don't want to clean up the shit after people. They don't want to deal with people's shitty lives. And so they check out. And I asked my father, I said, Dad, how do you feel about this? He says, I've never loved it more. Now, now, 
you know, if you go to clinical pastoral education, you can look at that and say, oh, he's got a Messiah complex. And yeah, there were issues with that. But um, he didn't find any better way than to pour his life out for people who have no hope. And, you know, I agree with him. Yeah, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm nuts. Maybe I should, you know, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to make it sound like, you know, my, my church is, is wonderfully generous to me. I have a, I have a decent home. I've, you know, I get a paid, I get paid regularly. You know, I have cars to drive. My kids go to college. I live a middle-class life. You know, that's part of what was so hard in the DR that I, you know, I had all this money and those people had nothing. And then you think, well, just give them your money. And then you realize, yeah, that, that doesn't work either. Our, our brokenness is way too complicated. So, so these are my thoughts as I listen to this, this chapter in, in Peterson and, um, you know, Forgive me the indulgence of being autobiographical and forgive me the indulgence of, of just really being a preacher. But, um, you know, so why, why do I listen to Peterson? I get that question. I, you know, some, some pastors or especially some Canadian pastors are, you know, like, yeah, don't listen to Peterson. I mean, this guy's a, this guy's a huckster. And I think, no, nah, I, I know hucksters. I, he could be duping me. I don't think so. I think he's, I think he's the genuine article. And, and, um, the reason, the reason I read these books and the reason I do what I do and make these silly little videos is, um, is this. Because, because I refuse to believe that the misery of this world will just end in a poof. And I, like Dostoevsky, believe that, that God will redeem this story. And in this story, you know... He'll make all sad things come untrue. And I believe that. And, and I don't think there's any better way to spend a life than to participate in that. That's why I'm a pastor. That's why I want to work with the people I work with. And that's why I do what I do. So, yeah, there's my story.